afternoon. I'm Victoria Marshall with the latest news from the Washington Watch News Desk. Fallout continues from President Joe Biden's poor debate performance last week. Prominent Democrats and media allies are still expressing their doubts at Biden's ability to be president for another four years. Does anyone seriously think that in four and a half years from now, Joe Biden is going to be what he needs to be to be an effective president? As he himself would say, come on, man, that's not going to be the case. And I, I hate to say it, but we've got to say it. So we've got Donald Trump, who is unfit by temperament, character, you name it, to be president. But I really believe that Joe Biden is no longer positioned, that he can be a successful president four and a half years from now. That is why I think we really need to change. He needs to be urged to step down. Well, these are people, several of them, who are very close to President Biden, who love him, have supported him, have been among, among them, or some people who have raised a lot of money for him. Uh, and they are adamant that what we saw the other night, the Joe Biden we saw, uh, is not an, a one-off, that there have been 15, 20 occasions in the last year and a half when the president has appeared somewhat as he did in that horror show uh, that we witnessed. And what's so significant is the people that this is coming from and also how many people around the president are aware of such incidents, including some reporters, incidentally, who, who have witnessed some of them. In a call with Democratic donors on Monday, President Biden's campaign chair acknowledged Biden's poor debate performance but defended his health, saying he has no plans of dropping out. Part of Democrats' damage control strategy is characterizing Biden's presidency as more than just the one man governing. A presidency is more than just one man, one woman. It's an administration. I would take Joe Biden on his worst day at mm -hmm. age 86, so long as he has people around him like, like Avril Haines, uh, Samantha Power, Gina Raimondo supporting him over Donald Trump any day with the crowd that was behind him on January 6, 2021. In response to Biden's obvious cognitive decline, Republican Congressman Chip Roy of Texas introduced a resolution Friday calling on Vice President Kamala Harris and members of the president's cabinet to activate the 25th Amendment, which declares a president incapable of executing the duties of his office and deputizes the vice president as president. And in other Capitol Hill news, Democrats continue to react against the Supreme Court's decision granting former President Trump immunity for official acts as president. Yesterday, President Biden gave a speech criticizing the ruling. I know I will respect the limits of the presidential powers I have for three and a half years. But any president, including Donald Trump, will now be free to ignore the law. I concur with Justice Sotomayor's dissent today. She, here's what she said. She said, in every use of official power, the president is now a king above the law. With fear for our democracy, I dissent. Congressional Democrats are also attacking the decision. Congressman Joe Morrell from New York said Monday that he will be introducing a constitutional amendment to reverse the Supreme Court's ruling. And Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, also from New York, said she would be filing articles of impeachment against at least one justice in the wake of the decision. She did not specify which one. And in other domestic news, the Biden administration is flying migrants deported by the Trump administration back into the U.S. According to an exclusive report by the Free Beacon, the Biden administration is flying previously deported Cameroonians whose asylum claims were determined to be invalid back into the United States. Internal memos reviewed by the Free Beacon show ICE officials are now helping previously deported Cameroonians relocate into the U.S. With this and other relaxed immigration policies, deportations have plunged under Biden, with fewer than 5 percent of the 3.2 million migrants caught at the border deported in 2023. And those are today's headlines. I'm Victoria Marshall. Up next is Washington Watch with Tony Perkins. We'll see you tomorrow with more news and commentary.
From the heart of our nation's capital in Washington, D.C., bringing compelling interviews, insightful analysis, taking you beyond the headlines and sound bites into conversations with our nation's leaders and newsmakers, all from a biblical worldview. Sitting in for Tony is today's host, Jody Heiss. Well, good afternoon and welcome to this Tuesday edition of Washington Watch. Yes, I'm Jody Heiss, an honor to be sitting in today for Tony and extremely glad to have you on board with us as well. While we have a ton of issues to cover today for you. So coming up today on Washington Watch, we have breaking news. The Biden administration sent a letter today to doctor and hospital associations regarding what are often referred to as, quote, emergency abortions. FRC's Meg Kilgannon will break all of this down for us a little bit later in the program. And then fallout continues from last Thursday night's debate. It sounds like you're actually open to the idea that it might be the right decision for him to step aside. I think what I'm stressing is it has to be his decision. Uh, but we have to be honest with ourselves that it wasn't just a horrible night. That was Democrat Congressman Mike Quigley of Illinois signaling to CNN's Casey Hunt his openness to replacing Joe Biden on the Democrat Party's presidential ticket. And frankly, he's not alone. The knives are coming out among Democrats following President Biden's primetime meltdown. We now have the very first Democratic congressman calling for President Biden to step down as the party's nominee. Well, coming up here in the next few moments, Congressman Ron Estes will be joining me with his reaction to all of this, as well as an update on House Republicans' effort to pass all 12 appropriation bills for 2025. And in the Middle East, Israel Defense Forces continue their progress against Hamas military operations, but escaped Hamas terrorists remain a very serious threat in the region. As the Prime Minister made clear yesterday, we are advancing to the end of the stage of eliminating Ham the Hamas terrorist army, and we will continue striking its remnants. That was Israeli government spokesman David Mincer earlier today. And CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell will be joining me from Jerusalem with the latest report. And we know that Israel needs continued prayer for peace in its land, but we also need to be firmly aware that committed Christians also need to be praying for our own nation. Well, recently, in a huge step of encouragement to me, and I believe it will be to you as well, Tennessee lawmakers have passed a resolution calling on the citizens of their state to participate in 31 days of prayer and fasting. The purpose? to seek God's hand of mercy and healing on Tennessee. Well, Tennessee State Representative Jason Zachary will be joining me to discuss what he hopes this resolution will bring to his state. And finally, the left's temper tantrum regarding yesterday's U.S. Supreme Court decision on presidential immunity has continued, even with President Biden jumping in. This decision today has continued the court's attack in recent years on a wide range of long-established legal principles in our nation. From gutting voting rights and civil rights, to taking away a woman's right to choose, to today's decision that undermines the rule of law of this nation. Well, we'll get the latest updates on this from Article Three Project Senior Counsel Will Chamberlain a little bit later in the program. And just by way of reminder, you've heard it, you've heard it, you've heard it. We've been talking about it. The GOP platform committee is going to be meeting before the upcoming convention in Milwaukee. And one of the big issues they're going to be dealing with is the issue of life. And unfortunately, we've seen a number within the GOP back away from a strong stance on life, regardless of the fact that we have had decades and decades of fighting for life. And then the overturn of Roe v. Wade. Well, now uh, that issue is coming up to the Republican Party platforms, and we're asking you to help us contact the chairs of the various Republican Party uh, states in order to let them know that we need to stand for life on the platform 
for the entire GOP. If you'd like to make your voice known, you can do so by signing a petition, uh, encouraging these folks to stand for the delegates who are going to be there fighting for life. You've got a couple of ways that you can sign the petition. You can go online to frcaction.org slash life, or you can simply text the word life to 67742. All right, so we've got a lot coming your way. We want to begin at breaking it all down right now. Always keep in mind, if you miss any portion of it, you can catch it all at TonyPerkins.com. Tons of archive programs, tons of resources, TonyPerkins.com. All right, let's jump in. Earlier today, Congressman Lloyd Doggett, a Democrat from Texas, became the very first congressional member of his party to publicly call for President Biden to step down as his party presidential nominee. All this comes about as a result of the horrible debate, debate performance by President Biden last Thursday. And as the Biden administration continues, frankly, to scramble to protect him, uh, what's going to happen? As Congressman Doggett's remarks probably indicate that there could be a domino effect about to happen. Well, joining me now to discuss this is Congressman Ron Estes. He serves on a number of committees in the House, including the Budget Committee and the All Important Ways and Means Committee. He represents the 4th Congressional District of the great state of Kansas. Congressman Estes, always great to see you, my friend. Welcome back to the program. Well, great. Thank you, Jody. Thanks for having me back on. Well, listen, let's start with the fallout. It all continues from the debate performance, the dismal performance from last week. What's your take on the Democrats scrambling uh, now for several days, uh, trying to figure out what they're going to do? And now Congressman Doggett comes out calling on the president to step down. Yeah, yeah, it, it really was a bad performance. Uh, and, and you see that. I, I, I'm not as concerned about how bad a performance he had at a debate, you know, compared to, say, his State of the Union uh, presentation format. I'm more worried about what we've been talking about as Republicans for a long period of time is just all the bad policies that President Biden's brought forth. I mean, we've got we've got inflation that's running rampant now. People are that you know having to pay 20 percent more on average uh, for uh, paying uh, food and groceries and 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 gas and and all the things that you need to run life. And th those are the types of things I think that are more concerning to people is. You look at the policies that President Biden's put in place versus the policies that President Trump had in place that were effective and the economy was going good when President Trump was in office. And, and that's what people are going to concentrate on, you know, in, in the next, uh, you know, four months as we lead up into the into the election in November. And people are looking at, you know, how do we keep the country moving forward? You know, I know uh, when I was there in Congress, always, always, it seemed that the legacy media was trying to highlight conflict within the Republican Party. Are you surprised by the reported infighting and conflict uh, within the Democrats that's being reported right now between their party and all the conflicting strategies that are coming forward? Are you surprised by any of this reporting? Well, I think part of it is if you look at the, the media, all, all facets of the media, uh, whether it's whether it's social media, whether it's TV, whether it's print, they want to talk about a controversial topic. So they're, if there's not one out there, they're going to try to create one. And, you know, whether it's talking about Republicans and Democrats fighting each other, whether it's talking about uh, Democrats fighting amongst themselves or, or Republicans uh, fighting amongst themselves. So it doesn't surprise me too much that uh, they've, they've actually now centered on the debate uh, because, as we all saw, it was a very poor performance uh, in the debate that uh, President Biden very clearly uh, couldn't articulate what his policies were that he's been an advocate for for the last three and a half years. Or, you know, it was even even laughable in terms of talking about uh, some of the things that he, he tried to say and that things like, uh, you know, that uh, he inherited inflation of 9 percent. Uh, when in reality, when President Trump left office, it was one one point four percent inflation year over year, and 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 those types of policies are the issues I think that people think about, even though the media tried to create this controversy, and 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 so it's it's a 
It's interesting now as I, I, I look and talk with uh, my colleagues on the Democrat side of the aisle when they, they talk about the, the media coming up and talking to them because they, they want to talk about the controversy as opposed to uh, let's focus on how do we get our debt down and our deficit down. Yeah, you know, I think even the examples you gave revealed that this was much more than a bad performance. It shows a problem leader that we have that, uh, and and I think that's what's causing all the the stir. And yet, the Biden administration, team team Biden, probably a better way of des uh, describing it, they're all trying to do some damage control. Uh, the president, as I'm sure you saw, he came out saying he doesn't walk as good as he used to walk or speak or debate as well as he used to. But he claimed that he still knows the truth. He still knows how to do the job. Uh, and here's a brief little clip from uh, Corrine Jean-Pierre, as uh, she repeated today. Play clip four for me, please. The president had a cold. He had a hoarse voice. You all heard it. That's why you reached out. But I will say this, and the president said this uh, over the past couple of days, certainly right after the debate, he knows how to do the job. And he knows how to do the job, not because he says it, because his record proves it. Damage control. Uh, what does the president's record say about all this? Yeah, it really is uh, laughable to to uh, hear President Biden say that he knows how to tell the truth. When you when you look at things like uh, border security, you know he claims the border secure, but you know in the last year we've had over three million people cross the border illegally, and you know that's almost the same number that happened during the four years that President Trump was in office. Or you look at President Biden saying that uh, he's brought gas prices down. And while it's true that they've come down from the peak hit when, when Putin invaded Ukraine, gas prices are still over a dollar higher than when President Biden came into office. And it's pure to his, it's his policies. So if, if his spokesperson is out saying that President Biden is intentionally doing these things and knows what he's doing, those are certainly the bad policies for America, and, and Americans know it. And that's why his approval rating is so bad. And, and that's why, you know, as, as the Democrats and, and Team Biden, as you put it, are scrambling so hard to figure out how do they put spin, uh, spin out on his performance and on the policies that he's promoting. Well, that's the only hope they have. Uh, switching topics, so if we can, last question. Uh, House Republicans are, you guys are trying to pass all 12 appropriations bill uh, going into 2025, and you're on the all important Ways and Means Committee. At the last year, national debt has increased nearly two and a half trillion more, now some 34 trillion. How does passing the budget through appropriations rather than a bloated omnibus that happens year after year, how does all this help rein in the debt? Yeah, it, it's really important as we go through the appropriations process. We've passed out of the House four of our 12 appropriations bills to fund, fund general government. But what we've seen so often over the last 25, 30 years is that instead of focusing on an agreed upon number through those 12 appropriations bills, there's some at the end of the year, some, some people that are dragging their feet or they want their pet projects put in, uh, they don't support the appropriations bills and you end up with, right. with really a bloated spending omnibus. And what that does is it, it creates this huge deficit that we've got and the debt that's growing uh, actually even, even bigger every week. Uh, $100,000 a second is what the federal government's borrowing. Wow based on all this. Congressman Ron Estes, we're going to have to bring it to a close right there. Thank you so much for your incredible leadership. It's always an honor to have you on Washington Watch. Hope you have a fantastic Independence Day. Well, great. You have a happy Fourth of July as well. Thank you. All right, friends, after the break, CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell will join me from Jerusalem. Stay tuned. Download the new Stand Firm app for Apple and Android phones today and join a wonderful community of fellow believers. We've created a special place for you to access news from a biblical perspective, read and listen to daily devotionals, pray for current events, and more. Share the Stand Firm app with your friends, family, and church members, and stand firm everywhere you go. Hello, I'm Jody Heiss, president of FRC Action. Here in America, we thank God for the right to vote, and we can all agree on the importance of this upcoming election. 
Many of us want to support candidates who share our values, but we're not comfortable supporting the big national political organizations. Well, we have a solution for supporting candidates through FRC Action's Faith, Family, and Freedom Fund. Being a super PAC, it allows for unlimited individual and corporate donations so we can endorse and fund campaigns for people who share our values. By giving to this fund, we're able to pull all of our contributions together and support and endorse like-minded candidates. That's how we move the needle. So let's be the best stewards possible and get the most out of our political contributions by uniting our efforts. For more information or to contribute, visit faithfamilyfreedomfund.org. Thank you so much and God bless you. All of us are born with the desire to find truth and meaning. Where did I come from? What happens when I die? While our answers to these questions may divide us, we are united in our need for the freedom to answer life's biggest questions and make life's biggest decisions for ourselves. That's why religious freedom matters for everyone. Religious freedom matters because the powerful have long wanted to control those who are less powerful. Religious freedom matters because the freedom of those who are different is often threatened by those who believe different is dangerous. At the Center for Religious Liberty at Family Research Council, we promote religious freedom for everyone because the only alternative is religious freedom for no one. We encourage Americans and the American government to engage and advocate for the persecuted, and they do. We work every day to bring good news to the afflicted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. We do it because that's what Jesus does. We work to give freedom to others because we ourselves have been set free. Washington Watch. I'm your host, Jody Heiss. It's always a great honor to be sitting in for Tony, and thank you for joining us. All right, even as Israel Defense Forces continue their progress destroying Hamas uh, and their military, Israeli officials have confirmed that uh, escaped Hamas terrorists remain a threat throughout the region. And according to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, the hunt for escaped ha Hamas terrorists remains a top priority to restore peace in Israel. And all this is coming at a time that the Biden administration is insisting on a post-war plan that includes Palestinians residing in Gaza under Arab leadership. This is what many people often refer to as a two-state solution. Well, joining me now from Jerusalem to discuss his reporting on Israel's war against Hamas is CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell. Chris, always great to have you on the program. Welcome back. Uh, great to be with you, Jody. All right. So first of all, please, if you would, catch us up on the progress that the IDF has recently made in Rafa uh, and throughout the entire Gaza Strip. Well, I was just reading a report from one of the generals there, and he said they've made a significant progress there in Rafa. Uh, they've eliminated a number of terrorists and uh, destroyed a lot of the infrastructure there in Rafa. And as you go through this last eight or nine months uh, of war, Jody, you see the infrastructure there in Gaza was so extensive, where tunnels uh, almost ubiquitous, almost every place you could go, and the amount of weapons uh, that you could find in almost any place uh, there in Gaza is uh, is really extraordinary. Uh, it just goes to show what's happening, what Hamas has been doing ever since 2007 when they took over Gaza. But right now, I would say that, that there's really kind of a pivotal uh, moment right now. Uh, IDF has made much progress in uh, in Rafa. They're also just uh, operating in a place called Khan Yunus, where some of Hamas has uh, has regrouped. So that's uh, part of a uh, part of their battle plan right now in Gaza. But also there is a pivoting right now, I guess, uh, towards the north. What's going to happen with Hezbollah? I think that's the question, the main question on most people's minds right now. What's going to happen? Is there going to be a major escalation in the uh, eight-month war that's been going on with Hezbollah? It's been a low-scale war, but there's a concern it could escalate dramatically. 
you would hope that Hezbollah, having witnessed what's happened to Hamas, would think twice before they escalate all of this. But even in the midst of this time where the Hamas military capabilities have certainly been decimated, it appears, uh, what, what are the remaining threats with these escaped terrorists? Is that a, obviously is a serious enough issue the prime minister is calling attention to it? Right. Uh, what, it, what it will look like right now, Jody, is more like an insurgency, something uh, people would remember back in Iraq, uh, uh, an insurgency that would be planting IEDs, uh, limited terror attacks, hit and run strikes. So there's a concern that once the main uh, infrastructure of Hamas and uh, the battalions have been eliminated, there is going to be a, an insurgency that could create a problem for, uh, for uh, the IDF there. And to your point about the uh, two-state solution, you know, the Biden administration may want a two-state solution. They've been advocating it uh, for many, many months. But there's really no appetite here in Israel for that. The Prime Minister Netanyahu is against that. And, uh, and there's many people that after October 7th, there is a whole new way of looking at uh, the Palestinian Authority and certainly Hamas. And so it's unlikely that there'll be a support here in Israeli public for a two-state solution, despite what the Biden administration wants. Yeah, so let's go down that path, Chris, if we can, a little bit further. I mean, obviously, Prime Minister Netanyahu's plan uh, after the war is on a absolute collision course, as you just referenced with the Biden administration. So where is all this going to lead? What do you think ultimately, uh, ultimately Israel will have the final voice, I'm saying, but what does that do with relations between Israel and the United States? Well, this is one of the things that's really strained relations with the Biden administration for many months. Uh, and that was one of the, this is one of the main disagreements between the coalition uh, with Netanyahu and the Biden administration, among many. And I would just add, you know, just the other day, uh, Representative McCall from Texas said that uh, there's seven weapon systems that the Biden administration is holding back uh, from Israel. So that's another big concern. But to the point about the two-state solution, uh, the Palestinian Authority uh, is what the Biden administration has been calling for, in part, that they would be one of the, uh, the people overseeing Gaza after the war. Uh, the Palestinian Authority, if you look at their statements in public, uh, many people see them just one step below Hamas. Uh, they consider this a religious war. They talk frequently about uh, replacing Israel, about returning to places like Haifa and Tel Aviv. Uh, so in terms of the Palestinian Authority, there would be very little appetite for that here. And yet this is one of the avenues that the Biden administration uh, is calling for. Now, the big question, Jody, really is going to be what happens after the day after, because there's going to be a lot of people that are uh, buying for what will happen, certainly Biden administration. Uh, you would hope that the Isra Israel would have the final say, uh, but there's a lot of people that want to actually uh, have a say in what's going to happen the day after the war in Gaza is over. Absolutely. So, so what is the, the general temperament of Israelis with the U.S. elections approaching and uh, a possible new administration? Well, I think uh, a lot of Israelis, like a lot of Americans, were dismayed by the performance by President uh, Joe Biden and uh, see him as a, uh, as a weakened leader. And one of the maxims here, the uh, people that... Uh, rely on here in the Middle East is you want to project strength. Anytime you project weakness, it fills a vacuum. So I think in terms of an Israeli point of view from uh, in the Middle East that's surrounded by its enemies, they want an American president that's going to uh, project strength, uh, resolve. And the way the Biden administration is really uh, uh, opposing uh, Israel during these last few months uh, really sends a signal to Israel's enemies, to Hezbollah, and particularly Iran. So I think from, a, from an Israeli point of view, they, they see a, a weakened president uh, in his performance last night, as well as his many actions against uh, the Jewish state, uh, as something uh, that's very, very concerning to them here in Israel. Well, Chris Mitchell, we can't thank you enough. CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief, thank you for staying up late and for joining us yet again on Washington Watch. We appreciate it a great deal.
Great to be with you, Jody. And I would just add, all this is why people should be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Absolutely. And we will indeed keep praying and continue to, for others to do the same. All right, friends, stay tuned. Much more Washington Watch right after this. Everything we do begins as an idea. Before there can be acts of courage, there must be the belief that some things are worth sacrificing for. Before there can be marriage, there is the idea that man should not be alone. Before there was freedom, there was the idea that individuals are created equal. It's true that all ideas have consequences, but we're less aware that all consequences are the fruit of ideas. Before there was murder, there was hate. Before there was a holocaust, there was the belief by some people that other people are undesirable. Our beliefs determine our behavior, and our beliefs about life's biggest questions determine our worldview. Where did I come from? Who decides what is right and wrong? What happens when I die? Our answers to these questions explain why people see the world so differently. Debates about abortion are really disagreements about where life gets its value. Debates over sexuality and gender and marriage are really disagreements about whether the rules are made by us or for us. What we think of as political debates are often much more than that. They're disagreements about the purpose of our lives and the source of truth. As Christians, our goal must be to think biblically about everything. Our goal is to help you see beyond red and blue, left and right, to see the battle of ideas at the root of it all. Our goal is to equip Christians with a biblical worldview and help them advance and defend the faith in their families, communities, and the public square. Cultural renewal doesn't begin with campaigns and elections. It begins with individuals turning from lies to truth. But that won't happen if people can't recognize a lie and don't believe truth exists. We want to help you see the spiritual war behind the political war, the truth claims behind the press release, and the forest from the trees. Thank you so much for joining us today on Washington Watch. Welcome back. All right, I want to share with you a story now that I believe will be a great source of encouragement and is certainly a story that you are not going to hear about, more than likely, from the legacy media. For the month of July, Tennessee Governor Bill Lee signed a House Joint Resolution, his Resolution 803. It asked the state citizens to participate in 31 days of prayer and fasting to seek God's hand of mercy and healing on Tennessee. The resolution passed overwhelmingly with both chambers of Tennessee's state government. It acknowledges that throughout America's history, leaders have made calls for these type of things of prayer and fasting time and again. Well, joining me now to discuss this is Tennessee State Representative Jason Zachary, who's a co-sponsor of the bill. He represents the 14th District of Tennessee. Representative Zachary, welcome to Washington Watch. Hey, Congressman, good to be with you. Well, it's great to have you, and I, I absolutely love this resolution and what you've done. Tell us about it, uh, and tell us why this is so important to Tennessee. Sure. We passed this in March, uh, and looking at July, obviously this is the month of our independence. Um, we're to be really transparent. We're following Pride Month, and that was part of the conversation: is how we reclaim our nation, and really the way we as believers approach that is through prayer. We know that we are facing an enemy who is looking to steal, kill, and destroy, and we are we we serve the Author of all things, the King of Kings, and so uh, it's basically Second Chronicles seven fourteen. I mean, we're simply asking the people of our state to join us and calling out, asking for the Lord to hear us from heaven as He says He will, and forgive us of our sins and heal our land. And so that's really what this is based on. And so even early this afternoon, I was texting with some pastors, just making sure they're aware of the resolution. Uh, we've got some uh, designated corporate times of prayer on courthouse steps. I know we had some churches uh, jump out in front of this and kick this off Sunday. I know the church I go to is a fairly large church. Uh, they're going to implement through the Sunday school classes. Again, just the people of our state 
being unified believers, calling out, saying, Lord, we need you. We have, we're a land who has lost its way. We're still the greatest nation in the world, the freest people, the wealthiest people. We've done more to advance the kingdom and further the cause of Christ than any other nation in the history of the world. Uh, but we're very different. Even the 10 years that I've been serving, you look at the things socially that are going on. Um, it's a very different nation. And we need the Lord to hear us and heal us and have grace on us yet once again. And so here in Tennessee, our elections, we have early voting that starts July 12th. And so that was also a part of it. And we have primaries uh, beginning August 1st. And so it leads into that. So multitude of reasons, but ultimately uh, we serve, I, I'm, I'm blessed to serve with quite a few people who just love Jesus. Governor Lee loves the Lord. He's called for prayer and fasting at certain times uh, back during COVID and with some natural disasters we've had. So this just kind of follows that model. And as you know, being in Georgia, the Southeast operates a little different right here in the Bible Belt than in many other states across the nation. But I'm just encouraged. The response has been really strong with people texting how they can be engaged. And, and if we can be unified, I'm so glad you, you guys are bringing a highlight to this, that people across the nation, just we seek and petition the Lord's face and, and ask him for grace as, uh, as we move through the rest of the year. Well, that is certainly our hope, and I don't think this is probably going to be picked up by the legacy media, but I'm so deeply, deeply grateful, all of us here at FRC, for your leadership in this role as a state legislature. Tell, us, tell me how this has been received uh, throughout the state by citizens, your constituents, and others that you're hearing from. Sure. Uh, it, it's, they've been encouraged. And every response, it's interesting, every response I've gotten have been from our older demographic. There's no, out, no, no doubt. I call them our legacy seniors. Our seniors throughout the state are so engaged, as you know, they're, they're the people that are primarily voting, that are engaged. Um, and the response has been strong. Most of that response has been from, uh, from seniors that, uh, throughout our community. A multi-denominations, again, I'm going to text thread with uh, Baptist pastors, uh, Presbyterian pastors, Pentecostal pastors, and and we have a really cool movement here in in uh, in, in Knox County. Uh, we're the third largest county in Tennessee. We have a really cool movement of younger pastors. Some of our legacy pastors have retired that have built really large churches, and now we've got this younger group coming in. It's really great to be on the text thread with those guys, and then thanking thanking us for create, for doing this thanking us for creating an awareness and then how they're going to implement this throughout the churches. And it's just, again, you know, again, you know, in Georgia, it's just things like this, things of the Holy Spirit, when they're discerned by believers, they're received differently. And it's easy to get a buy-in throughout our state. Again, when you've got uh, for, former Governor Haslam, who was the predecessor to Governor Lee, Governor Lee's in his second term, but Governor Haslam loved Jesus. He would do things like this. Uh, and so the five terms I've served, served in the legislature, we have always taken steps um, that are faith-based. And we've got an Office of Faith-Based Initiatives that's in the executive branch now. And so, again, it's just so, mu so much of that is received so well by the people of our state because, again, being in the Bible Belt, uh, people love the Lord. And, and again, you've got Christ followers, passionate Christ followers that I serve with that um, that have really embraced this. And so it's encouraging to see. And hopefully throughout July, we'll have people praying and fasting. And we're confident the Lord will hear us and the Lord will respond to our prayer and petition to him. Well, it's encouraging to all of us. We've only got about 30 seconds after I asked this question. But uh, look, this has been part of our nation's history time and again. But how do you think others in other states could perhaps encourage their legislators to do something similar? Well, I, I think it's it's reaching out to pastors, engaging your pastors, having your pastors reach out to the legislators as well. But I think just people throughout the nation just need to call their local state rep, their state senator, and just say, hey, Tennessee's done this. We need to make a concerted effort to take this step for our state as well, because right. it matters. It makes, it makes a difference. Thank you, Tennessee State Representative Jason Zachary. Great story. Thank you so much for your leadership, and thanks for coming on the program. All right, friends, yesterday's Supreme Court decision regarding presidential immunity, a big, big deal. And as you can imagine, there is a ton of mudslinging and dust flying as a result. We'll bring it all your way right after the break, so stay tuned. Join us October 3rd through the 6th as we gather with spiritually active, governance-engaged conservatives from across America at the Pray Vote Stand Summit in Washington, D.C. We'll pray for our nation, engage in government and culture, and stand for biblical truth 
alongside Christian leaders, worldview experts, and government officials. We'll discuss important issues like the sanctity of life, religious freedom, protecting students, strengthening families, praying for our nation, and how you can impact America's future from a biblical worldview. Our nation stands at a critical juncture, and we must ensure that the issues impacting faith, family, and freedom are understood and advanced. Register by July 8th and receive a $70 discount off admission. Register now at PrayVoteStand.org. That's PrayVoteStand.org. Jesus said in John 15, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. In 2024, in these divided and uncertain times, how can this be possible? By abiding in him through his word. At Family Research Council, we wanna help you do that, which is the reason for the Stand on the Word Bible Reading Plan. In just 10 to 15 minutes each day, you will have read the entire Bible in just two years. But more importantly, you will be abiding in Him daily. Find our Bible reading plan at frc.org slash Bible. And join Tony Perkins each weekday for a 10-minute devotional inspired by the daily reading and designed to encourage you on this journey through the Bible. Listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And remember, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of our God will stand forever. Research has found that there are 59 million American adults who are a lot like you. There are millions of people around the country who are born again, deeply committed to practicing their faith, and believe the Bible is the reliable Word of God. But that's not all. They're also engaged in our government. They're voters. They're more likely to be involved in their community, and they're making a difference in elections. The problem is that a lot of them feel alone too. We want to change that. FRC wants to connect these 59 million Americans to speak the truth together, no matter the cost. If you want to learn more about this group and what it means to be a spiritually active, governance-engaged conservative, or if you want to find out if you are one of these sage cons yourself, join us. Go to frc.org slash s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sage con, to learn more. That's s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sage con, to learn more. And welcome back to Washington Watch. So glad to have you on board with us. I am Jody Heiss and glad to be sitting in today for Tony. All right, I started this show by saying we had some breaking news. And I want to uh, take a moment to bring you up to speed on that. Today, the Biden administration sent a letter to emergency room doctors across the nation informing them that they must perform emergency abortions when necessary to save a pregnant woman's health, whatever exactly that means. But in the letter, uh, Health and Human Service Secretary Becerra, along with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Director Chiquita brooks Lashore, reminded hospitals of their legal duty to offer stabilizing treatment, which could include abortions. Well, this letter was in reaction to, and I think this is important for the overall context, but it's a reaction to the Supreme Court's decision last month regarding Idaho's abortion law. Well, here to react to all of this is Meg Kilgannon. She's a senior fellow for education studies at the Family Research Council. Meg, welcome back to Washington Watch, and thank you for bringing us up to speed on this breaking news. Thanks for having me, Jody. All right, well, let's start with your overall reaction. Is this just uh, another sign of the Biden administration pushing its unholy trinity of abortion, LGBT, and climate? What's going on here? Yeah, I, I, you know, as a Catholic, I am once again astounded and yet also not surprised that the Biden administration, Catholic President Joe Biden, and Catholic HHS Secretary Becerra are going to use every tool in the toolbox, whether it's legal or not, to push an abortion agenda. So this letter that's been released that is so new, we don't even have a copy of it yet, is designed to bully and threaten hospitals across the country, and many of them are Catholic hospitals, 
to bully and threaten them into performing abortions in cases where a woman comes to the emergency room after having taken an abortion pill and she is hemorrhaging and she is just in a, in a medical state that is dire. They want to make sure that that woman is treated, and of course, we all want to make sure that woman is treated, but they want to make sure that she's treated by giving her an abortion. And so this is a prime right. example of how the Democrat Party, and the Democrat leaders, whether they're Catholic or not, use every power they have to make sure the abortion agenda is advanced in this country. Yeah, it's just unbelievable. Uh, their obsession with killing babies is is mind-boggling. You mentioned uh, how many uh, Catholic hospitals could be impacted by this, and it is true. I think four of the ten largest U.S. hospital chains by, by number, uh, at least by number of beds, they, we're, we're talking Catholic hospitals. Right. Uh, so let me ask you, are, are these hospitals and perhaps other faith-based hospitals going to be forced to violate their religious beliefs under this? Could some of them perhaps even be forced to close because they refuse to violate their deeply held religious convictions? Well, I'm, I'm sure that that is, you know, an unfortunate consequence that's possible under this scenario, because the Biden administration is using the threat of withholding Medicare and Medicaid funds from these institutions if they think that those hospitals are not performing these abortions. So it, this is just like when the Obama administration issued the Dear Colleague to Schools, the Dear Colleague letter to schools about Title IX and letting boys in the girls' bathrooms and locker rooms because they were going to support uh, transgender students. This is the exact same kind of tactic. They are, they are trying to make a rule here without making a rule. They are trying to exert an authority that isn't quite clear. And they are willing to say whatever they have to say so that they can tell the American voter that they are for abortion all the time. Well, it's stunning. Uh, and I, I'll just, I've got to say this. This is yet another example of the reality. This is not pre This is reality, that the Democrats will do whatever they can to continue pushing their abortion agenda forward. And it is for that reason that we must continue standing for life. And even as the GOP platform is coming underway, this is a time that we've got to keep life in the platform of the GOP. Uh, it's a critical issue. And we need to understand this is a federal issue, not just something that, go that belongs to the states. It's a both and uh, scenario politically, and certainly one from the platform perspective we need to keep on the forefront. Thank you so much, Meg Kilgannon, FRC's Senior Fellow for Educational Studies. We appreciate you keeping us informed on this breaking news and appreciate so much all that you do. Thank you. All right, now let's switch gears. Following the U.S. Supreme Court decision yesterday in the case Trump v. the United States, that is where the court held that a former president has absolute immu immunity for his core constitutional powers, President Biden has emerged from his post-debate retreat, where we've not seen hide or hair of him, but he emerged uh, from all of that to give a public appearance and to blast, literally, the decision from the Supreme Court. And this comes as the left continues his temper tantrum, uh, while at the same time hypothesizing some outlandish scenarios that they claim the court has now enabled. So uh, all of this comes as Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg has said today that he's not going to oppose former President Trump's request to delay the sentencing in his hush money trial following the Supreme Court ruling. So a lot taking place around all of this. And joining me now with an analysis of the Supreme Court's decision and what today's events mean moving forward is Article Three Project Senior Counsel Will Chamberlain. Will, welcome back to Washington Watch. Great to have you. Uh, great to be with you, Jody. All right. So before we get into all the details, uh, the events of today certainly mean, if nothing else, that uh, former President Trump's sentencing is not going to occur until after the Republican convention later on this month. Is that correct? That's correct. Sentencing's been delayed until September. 
Okay, so they could do it right after the convention, right before uh, early voting starts in some places. Is that mm -hmm. intentional? Uh, I, I think it's actually, they're a little more worried that they're going to have to toss this uh, jury verdict out. Um, the, I didn't originally see the problem for the New York case that came from the Supreme Court ruling, but now I do. Um, the Supreme Court didn't just tell that you couldn't prosecute a president for their official acts, it's that you couldn't bring in evidence of their official acts to help prove other crimes. And mm -hmm. for reasons that are escape me, the, the New York prosecutors decided to go ahead and bring in this evidence, bring in official acts evidence to the jury, even as President Trump's lawyers flagged this issue, objected, and said that this evidence shouldn't be brought in because it's immune, uh, because it's covered by immunity. And now that the Supreme Court ruling has come out, it means that there's a bunch of evidence in this trial that shouldn't have been there, which suggests that there needs to be a mistrial and, and a new trial if they're going to prosecute this case wow. at all. Wow. Uh, great point, bringing, uh, connecting all those dots. All right. So there was some other news today. I tried to try to if you can, kind of fill us in on uh, today's events as a whole. What else do, does all this tell us? Well, I mean, it's the right answer because it prevents us a tit-for-tat escalation of prosecuting former presidents. Um, I'm not one for unilateral disarmament. So if this ruling came out the other way and President Trump prevailed in November, which I think he almost certainly will now, um, I was going to, you know, I and many others would have demanded prosecutions of both Joe Biden and Barack Obama for their official acts that could, were covered by general criminal laws. Um, President Obama assassinated an American citizen, um, the son of Allah Laki, back way back when he was president. Um, president Biden has done, done a number of very lawless things, um, from paroling uh, hundreds of thousands of people at the border unlawfully to his blatant disregard of the Supreme Court's ruling on student loans. So if they have no protection for their official acts while in office, well, they can be prosecuted for those things. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's, uh, I guess, uh, rather than coming out and blasting the decision, President Biden probably ought to be thanking them himself. That's exactly right. Uh, so, yeah. So so uh, switching, uh, if we can, to the this whole immunity decision from the Supreme Court, What's kind of amazing to me is all the hypothetical scenarios that are being invented by the left as to what this decision is going to lead to. What do you make of all of that? Yeah, I mean, I keep hearing about the SEAL Team 6 scenario, which is which is absurd for five actual, five independent reasons. So the first is— Yeah, relay that uh, so our viewers and listeners know exactly what, what they're claiming. So the Democrats claim that if the president has any kind of immunity for their official acts, that they can then lawfully order SEAL Team 6 to assassinate their political opponents. That's the Unbelievable. The like yeah, the Supreme you, you Court why is giving a stamp on assassinations. Wow. Yeah, you, you wonder why their mind goes that way, honestly. Like, it's it's a little bit concerning independently. But uh, the, the there's a lot of reasons that hypothetical is silly. First, uh, the UCMJ binds military members who are not allowed to follow unlawful orders in the first place, they would reject that. Second, in a world where our military was working with the president to assassinate their political opponents, that would be a world where we were dealing with an actual coup that had succeeded, <laughs> right? <laughs> so right. Uh, yeah. I don't think that the courts are not the remedy for a world in which we have a successful military coup. I think that the, whether or not later on we would hope to prosecute the president is the least of our concerns at that point. Um, third, uh, there's no reason to think that the Supreme Court ruling would actually immunize this conduct by a president. It doesn't give absolute immunity to all official acts that the president does, only to core functions of the president. And the ultra virez use of the military in domestically, I don't believe, would be a core function of the government and would be something that the court would allow to be prosecuted. And there's enough leeway in the Supreme Court opinion that in the event that a president did, in fact, use the military to assassinate his political opponents, again, think about how silly that is, there is enough leeway that a future Supreme Court prosecuting such a president would be able to ensure that they were um, able to be prosecuted and convicted. Wow. Well, ultimately, it seems to me that this decision at the end of the day was the direct result of the Democratic Party's lawfare, 
against former President Trump. None of this needed to happen. None of this, in my opinion, would have happened. Uh, it is only here, and we're only dealing with it because of the left's overreach. Is, is that uh, an accurate assessment? Correct. No president has been prosecuted before. Um, and the Democrats try to claim that, oh, well, President you know, Trump is uniquely criminal. And I mean, but we can talk about how other presidents have done things with their official acts that can be construed as crimes if you don't find, you sort of assume that they are immune from prosecution under, under general laws. So it's not that President Trump did anything unique here. It's that the Democrats decided in their zeal to do something that's never been done in our republic before and prosecute a former president. Right. Okay, so on another topic, the, uh, ju the House Judiciary Committee has filed a lawsuit against Attorney General Merrick Garland, uh, they did this yesterday, uh, to contest the Biden administration invoking executive privilege to withhold the audio. Uh, so uh, did the president's, and I just got to ask you, did, did the president's horrible debate performance reinforce the severity of all of this, that uh, Attorney General Merrick Garland, Garland's contempt of Congress for refusing to deliver these recordings is fully justified, and it was evident in the debate. Yeah, I mean, you, you understand why he wanted to withhold the recordings now. Right. Pretty clearly would reveal just how, um, just how far his cognitive decline has gone. That said, there's no re legitimate lawful basis for Merrick Garland to refuse to release this, this audio tape. Remember, he already released the transcript. Uh, it's, it's hard to imagine how the transcript could be unprivileged and able to be released, but the, the recording itself could be privileged. That doesn't make any sense at all. So what would happen with the audio? What are you leading to there? We have the transcript. What, what else is um, revealed, if we can say, with the audio coming? Well, the audio shows exactly what he said and how he said it, right? You know, the transcript is somebody else's interpretation of that audio tape. The audio tape is we get to hear with our own ears exactly what Joe Biden sounded like in those interviews. And remember, those are the interviews that led special counsel her to conclude that Joe Biden was an elderly, well-meaning man with a poor memory. And as a result of that, it would be impossible to prosecute him because um, a lot of the the crimes that he would be charged with would have intent requirements that her didn't think we could he could prove because he couldn't prove that Joe Biden knew what he was doing. Well, it seems to me that little by little, the entire, not only the administration, but the entire Democratic Party right now is being squeezed into a corner where there have been so many attempts to hide, to cover up, to protect the president. All that seems to be unraveling right now. Do you think it's an authentic unraveling or somehow they're, or are they going to pull another rabbit out of the hat and keep moving forward? No, it's, it's an authentic unraveling. This isn't part of any plan. Uh, because there's no good alternative for the Democrats. A lot of people are saying, oh, well, there will be an easy switcheroo. They'll just switch somebody out for Biden, and that was the plan all along. Biden owns those delegates. They're his. They don't belong to anybody else. And remember Ralph Northam. Remember how the Democrats wanted him to resign after the whole he was shown to be wearing blackface? They couldn't make him resign, so he stayed around in office. Biden doesn't have an incentive to resign. He doesn't have an incentive to give up his delegates. So why would he? Wow. Unbelievably interesting. Thank you, Will Chamberlain. Uh, fascinating discussion. Uh, thanks for all that you do and Article 3 Project. You guys are fantastic. We deeply appreciate you coming on the program and unraveling all this that is unraveling for us. We appreciate it. Thank you, Jody. All right. Have a great July 4th weekend. All right, friends, that wraps up this edition of Washington Watch. Thank you so much for joining us. and. Uh, Amazing information we're honored to bring your way. Hope you have a fantastic evening and look forward to being with you tomorrow again right here on Washington Watch. Washington Watch with Tony Perkins is brought to you by Family Research Council and is entirely listener supported. Portions of the show discussing candidates are brought to you by Family Research Council Action. For more information on anything you heard today or to find out how you can partner with us in our ongoing efforts to promote faith, family, and freedom, visit TonyPerkins.com.